Madeline McEwnan, welcome. She turned 90 last Thursday. She was born in Switzerland and is the daughter of German Jews who were fleeing the Nazis. The family moved to the US when she was a child and she currently lives on the other side of the state, so she got the foliage tour on the way over. Um, prior to getting into politics, I understand that she was a newspaper reporter, a TV producer, and a radio talk show host. In the 1970s, which is when I moved to the state, Madeline was serving as a representative in the General Assembly. She was elected Lieutenant Governor in 1979, and she served four years under Richard Snelling. But the important part is, is that she later served three terms from 1985 until 91 as a 77th Governor of Vermont, the only female governor to date, as well as the first Jew to hold the seat. While governor, she appointed the first woman to the Vermont Supreme Court. After she stopped being the governor, she was a member of President Bill Clinton's administration and she served as Deputy, Deputy Secretary of Education from 93 to 97, when she became the ambassador to Switzerland as well as Liechtenstein. Madeleine Cunin has been very involved in issues around women and children and education and the environment both before and after holding office. She's taught or lectured at so many universities, I'm not even gonna start the list. She now has six published books. The first one, almost 30 years ago, Living a Political Life. The second, Pearls, Politics, and Power, How Women Can Women Win and Lead. The third one is The New Feminist Agenda, Defining the Next Revolution for Women, Work, and Family. And then, a much more personal book, Coming of Age, My Journey to the 80s, was published, published in 2018. Her first book of poetry was published two years ago, entitled Red Kite, Blue Sky, and the poems in Walk With Me uh, is a newly published book, and that's what she's gonna be sharing with us this evening. So welcome. Thank you. You're that was a very thorough and detailed introduction, <laughs> and uh, I can tell much thought went into it, so thank you very much. And I'm overwhelmed by this beautiful church library. It looks like a church, <laughs> but it's really stunning. So I think we're fortunate to be here. And it was a lovely drive down from Shelburne, and uh, I think in a week it'll just be perfect. So the season is here. And, you know, I've sort of gone on a journey from being a politician to being a poet. And it's, it's interesting that when I, as I became older, I sort of opened up to poetry, and you know, as a politician, you're you're outward. You you uh, display yourself in a very open way to win votes or follow your dreams. But as a poet, you're more inward and contemplative, and just let that part of you develop. There's some contradiction there, though. While you're writing poetry, you're in your own enclosed world. But then you end up on, at a podium <laughs> like this and greet the world again in a very open way. And I remember when I published my first book, I was very anxious about letting go of it and sending it off by a package at the post office. And I spent about 10 minutes discussing how we shall send it with the postmistress. Because <laughs> I felt I was leaving my, my children. And it was finally in a very special wrap package that my, po my book of poems was living a political life. It really wasn't a book of poems. It was mostly my thoughts about how I got into politics. 
I haven't written poetry all of my life, but uh, when I was 10 years old, I wrote a poem. And then every once in a while, but not steadily, but there's a certain freedom in getting older. You now know how old I am, of course. And when I was 10 years old, I was very anxious to grow up. And I remember standing in front of our apartment building, feeling very proud of myself at 10 years old. And then by the time I became 30, I uh, wondered what I would do with my life. A friend of mine and I wheeled our babies to a coffee shop in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and we thought life is over. That was a time when the saying, common saying was, don't trust anybody over 30. And being on the brink uh, made us feel, feel that there was no hope. But if only somebody had tapped me on the shoulder at that time and said not to worry, you'll be governor of Vermont. <laughs> no such message came to me. But uh, now, in the old, old age, people actually congratulate you. <laughs> and so I'm going to enjoy as much of that as I can. I'll read the first poem that the book is named after. Walk with me, get your hat and coat and walk with me. I heard the words sung this afternoon during a folk music concert. They were seductive. Walk with me through the woods, along the sea, up the mountain. Walk with me, yes. I had a debate about the ending of this poem. Um, first I had yes, and then I had yes, I will, and then I went back to yes. So if you want to take a vote, <laughs> I don't know which one you prefer. Uh, yes. Since we're going to have a conversation later, I'll just not go through the whole volume of poems I planned. This one is called Kaddish, and it's a uh, prayer when somebody dies in Judaism. My father died when I was two and a half, some 85 years ago. I work hard to picture him alive so I can mourn him on the anniversary of his death and recite Kaddish according to law. Photographs, some brown, some black, are the only leavings of his life. Small swatches that I try to sew together into a garment that fits his elegant pose. He was a miser with memories and with his love for me. If he had really loved me, would he have killed himself by sliding over the side of the rowboat and letting himself slip into the blue waters of Lake Zurich? Was it a sunny day, that July day in 1935? I like to think that the lake sparkled, that the first gulps of water tasted fine, quenching his tortured th thirst. When did the water turn black? When was he retching for air? When did his feet scream? This is a little more cheerful. It's Mrs. May's apple cake. May was my maiden name. 
The one stiff white paper card had been squeezed into the gray metal box too long. Now it was yellow and soft like an old linen dish towel and smelled like dust. All that pulling the card out and forcing it back in had frayed the edges and folded the corners up, but the words still spoke. Mrs. May's apple cake. She had called the dough Mürbeteig, a name extracted from Alsace, where they spoke both German and French. The card instructed me in English. Cream a quarter of a pound of butter, add sugar, one egg, sift a cup of flour with one half teaspoon baking powder. Oh, I forgot a pinch of salt. Too late. I followed her recipe more or less. I scraped out the apple core, sliced the apples nice and thin, and layered them in a circle around the dough. I splashed a half a cup of cream into a small blue bowl, whisked the cream together with a tablespoon of sugar and one fat egg. I spilled the mixture over the apples, drowning them in glossy yellow, and slid them into the oven carefully, while my mother seemed to be at my side. When I was nursing my babies, when I was nursing my babies, I sat in an old rocking chair back and forth, suck, suck. I had painted it a pale violet, decorated the sides with vines in a darker violet. When my husband and I parted, I forgot to ask for the chair. Years went by and I didn't miss the rocking chair. Years later, when he moved out of the house, he gave me the chair back. It now is wedged into a crowded corner in my bedroom where its feet stick out. I tend to trip over it in the middle of the night. I have not sat in it, but I must keep it now that I have it. I wrote several poems about difficulty sleeping. This is a short one. Losing sleep. When the switch goes off without me, I want to lose myself in mindless dark. Another hour has passed while I did nothing except struggle with Morpheus and shove the cat to the other side of the bed. <laughs> Spring ice, weighted snow on red tulips, untimely, looks like a tender tucking in, in except their backs are curved, bowing helplessly as if in obeyance to a pitiless ice god. Trying to. At the eye doctor. I sat in the ophthalmologist's waiting room for two and a half hours with my New Yorker magazine that I could not read because my eyes were dilated. <laughs> I could not see, but I could think about all the wasted time spent sitting in a chair looking at other patients, wondering who would be next. When would it be my turn? Don't they understand? I don't have time to waste. I am old. I focus on what patients are wearing, their sneakers and socks, their hair, their hands, their eyes. Meanwhile, I rehearse how I would complain to the doctor, to anyone, about how badly they managed the system. It was for the convenience of the doctor, not the patient. 
I would explain we were helpless, sitting for hours in our chairs, staring at every nurse who walked by, hoping we would be next. The door opened. The smiling doctor walked in. Hi, Madeline, he exclaimed. How's your son, Adam? Fine, I said and smiled back. I forgot every word I was going to say. <laughs> You, you've all been there. <laughs> this is about my former second husband, John Hennessy. Goodbye, too. I knew but didn't know all those soft goodbyes when I grew impatient with your dying. You worked hard to reach the end, in and out, pause, in more slowly, out, not yet. Pause, counting, wait, stop, gone. Blood drained, gray still, untouchable, cold. I braved a kiss on your cool forehead, the only part I dared to touch and make my exit. I beckon you back one more time to pocket my hand in yours I dare to touch. This one is called Driving. I felt abandoned when the car in front of me took a right turn and disappeared. We had kept a safe distance between us for miles moving in and out of lanes, keeping the identical speed. We had become partners, stopping simultaneously at every red light, starting on cue when the light turned green, pausing patiently at every yellow. I didn't need to know the driver or the number of passengers, if any. It was the car I had identified with as we drove almost in tandem on this ribbon road. Other cars overtook me. They meant nothing to me, but when my car took a right-hand turn without me, I was bereft. <laughs> we still keep going? A hand at my back. There was a hand at my back when John was alive. I felt it. I was loved. I was saved from my own footsteps, his matching line. Questions suspended in the air, caught by him and returned without effort. I spoke my thoughts out loud where they landed on his fingertips. I remember how I felt letting go. Having been loved made me brave. Reading a book by the lake. I bought a book to read a while. I sat on the porch in a green painted rocking chair with a frayed straw seat that sagged in the middle. I thought I could do both, look at the navy blue lake and turn the page to chapter one, but the lake would not let me wander. It pulled me back before I reached page two. I was drawn to the water by horizontal gravity, arrested by the sparkle of what seemed like hundreds or was it thousands of frenzied sparkling butterflies hip-hopping on the lake. The lake demanded nothing of me, not even my attention. It simply was. I was simply there. I was absorbing some restorative elixir for the rest of the days or the rest of my life. I'm looking for a poem I can't find. 
was and found. I looked under the bed first for my hearing aid. <laughs> it might have fallen off when I put my earrings on, too dark to see much under the bed except for crumpled Kleenex. The silver piece that fit behind my ear would have glistened. It would have announced itself. I looked further in unlikely places just in case behind the toilet bowl, in the wastebasket, covered by piles of papers, under the pillows in the living room, next to my computer, amid pens that no longer wrote, on the bed spread, perhaps in case it dropped when I had been making the bed, under the dining room table, dropped while eating dinner, I moved the chairs and looked more than once, and once again and again. Losing the hearing aid was worse than losing an earring, like I had done the day before. The hearing aid was a part of my body. I was lopsided with just one in my left ear. I was almost deaf, oblivious to what was happening around me. I had to find it. I talked myself into believing I could replace just one hearing aid and it would not cost thousands of dollars like I feared two earrings would. After my third round of searching both the house and my car, I called the Loose Hearing Center to find out how long it would take to get one new hearing aid. And God forbid, what would it cost? There's more. Stephanie was not in. Leave a message, I was told. I did try not to sound foolish having gotten that close to spending a fortune to buy a new one. I retraced my steps once more. I stopped for the fourth time at the small hallway table which I, where I kept face masks and winter hats. I picked everything up with my two fingers, one by one, and shook it. A tiny silver triangle hung from a string on the mask. Oh, I sang. <laughs> Bounce, laughter bounced inside me. For the first time, I had found out the secret source of happiness. <laughs> Lose something precious, like a diamond ring or a hearing aid. Look for it long enough to waste half or a whole day suffer self-flagellation. When all hope is gone, you find it. <laughs> These pages stick together more than I Fear, I'm afraid not for myself. I have almost arrived where I was going to go. I fear for the others, the children and their children and those after that. How will they carry on in a burning world? They read the word, they read the words, do not touch nailed to the globe, believing like toddlers, warned to stay away from a hissing stove. I fear water like never before. A blind river insists on smashing everything in its way. Cars upside down, dolls without heads. I fear storms, short blinds, once fastened firm, ripped off, splashing second floor windows, forcing red roofs to run away. 
I see a farmer standing before his field, grown hard as a dinner plate, crushed to death by drought. When that day comes, when my children must move on to find shade from the sun, dry dirt away from the rain, I'll be gone. But now as we wait, I grow afraid for them. <coughs> Excuse me. Grammy's hand. I want to hold Grammy's hand, she said. No lover could have made me swoon like she did. Her words went whoosh to my heart. Three years old, full of chatter, spilling into our air. Such power she has to give or withhold, leaving me suspended in anticipation until I feel her small hand surrounded by mine while we walk in step. Should I pause at this point? That's a, that's a great place to stop reading. Thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome to having a chair over here, and uh, we'll continue I'll, talking. I'll continue talking? Yeah. Oh, with you? Yeah. Yes. I have questions, and I know, whoops. Oh, I forgot I was right. That's okay, okay. Just to add a little problem. Yeah. <laughs> Here, you know what? We can just put this on the table. Have a seat and I'll clip it to you and we don't do anything about it. That's awesome. Okay. That should work now. And, uh, of course, I came up with more questions while you were reading. But um, can everybody hear? Is that okay. okay. Um, I have a few questions, and then we're going to open it up. And mostly, my first question had to do. You spoke a little bit to, about it about how poetry is introspective, and um, the the prose, the political writing, and for your political life is more out. But when you publish very personal poems. You're putting them out in the world. How does that balance work for you? Because these are very, very personal poems. Yes, I get nervous. <laughs> no, I. I mean, when I write, I don't. I try not to censor myself, though I do, somewhat. I guess everybody who writes does, but. I let my inner voice speak, uh, and I think of things as I think about them. I mean, it, mm. writing is a mystery. I mean, you don't know exactly where it comes or how, what shape it will take. But I left some poems out in my reading just now, because and this is not to entice you to buy the book, but if you, if you really want to know about the poems I read left out, <laughs> you'll have to buy the book. But uh, there are some things I can't read in public, and the poem about my father was difficult to read. Uh, but uh, I think when you get older, you, you naturally think more about the past. That, uh, the poems that I'm nervous about, other people like. And Even the people you're writing about? Yeah, I don't name them, <laughs> except I do name some, yes. Uh, it's not just the people, it's, it's the thoughts. It's the most that yeah. Thought, yeah. So it's, it's not easy, uh, but I, I, when I wrote my first book, Living a Political Life, where I mentioned my children but don't say much about them, and, and I met somebody at, at a reading, he said, how are your children, Peter and Julia and Adams? And I thought, how do you know? <laughs> and of course, I had mentioned them in the book, so 
you keep something private and you take a risk. Okay. Well, um, one of the things I really appreciate about the poems is the balance that you put in between the serious, like the poem about your father, and the humor, because I'm not sure the audience tonight expected to come and laugh out loud very much. And I'm wondering, you say you don't self-censor. Does poetry help you stay on the bright side, or is that where you naturally are? It's, 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 you, do, you do a wonderful balancing, at least in this collection, of um, the uh, smiling and, and the heart. Yeah, I, I love to have people laugh. I mean, it's always a shock and it's always a delight. But yeah, I, think, I mean, I'm 90 years old, which I'm still trying to absorb, but I'm also happy. I mean, a lot of the time and look forward to what's next. Uh, I think that's, that's what you do. All your life, you're curious about what's next. You don't have to be old to ask that question. But I still want to do things. I still want to write. I still want to walk. I can't call them hikes, but walks. <laughs> uh, but I still am interested in other people. So life doesn't stop. If you're fortunate, I'm fortunate that I'm pretty good at health. Uh, and I'm fortunate that I live in a place called Wake Robin, which is a little bit like Kendall, uh, closer to home. And so I have basic security, and I know that's a privilege. So going back in time, you traveled wildly. Why? I don't know if it was wildly. <laughs> you traveled widely, um, Japan, Germany, and you're fluent in German and French. How does that um, experience of languages uh, uh, speak to the your your word use in your poetry, or does it not really affect it? Well, I'm not fluent in German and French, oh. but I can speak it haltingly, uh, and I can overhear other people when <laughs> <laughs> I'm traveling. Uh, but uh, I wrote a poem which I didn't read called Weltschmerz, which is a German expression means pain for the world. And it's very hard to translate, but it's sort of a, a global response to what is happening. Uh, I see you nodding. Do you speak German? A little bit. Well, well, I have both threads, and I think I'm lucky that my first language was German or Swiss German. Uh, I think it does broaden your your vocabulary, and sometimes even now a, a Swiss word will come first to my mind, and it, it sort of enriches you. Because when I first came to the United States with my mother and brother at the age of six and a half, I wanted to get rid of the old language as quick as possible. But now, now I appreciate it. You said a little bit earlier um, that it, it, when your first book came out, actually, no, you said when you were 30, you wish somebody had told you you'd be governor. When your first book came out, which is now nearly 30 years ago, is there something that you would have been able to tell? You wish that you would, you, is there something you know now that you wish you could have told that 60-year-old woman? Hmm. I don't know. I have to, I guess that it's worth the risk. Uh, and often we regret not what we do, but what we haven't done, and the voyages we didn't take, the speeches we didn't make, the answer we didn't give. So I would only wish I had courage. It seems to me like you had quite a bit of it. Um, 
Um, I would like to, at this point in time, open to quite, I have more, but I don't need to tie, <coughs> tie up with the uh, evening. Do people have questions they would like to ask about the poems or? Being 90? <laughs> yes, hi. I, um, I was in uh, Burlington in 1985, and I was uh, campaigning for you, and I was at your inaugural party. Oh, and wonderful. I just wanted to say that it, it's just lovely to be here and to, to see you again and to, to hear your lovely poems. So I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you very much. I'm happy that you feel that way about your experience. Yeah. Are there other questions? Okay, well, I'm going to ask one of my favorite questions to ask writers and authors, especially someone with your background. When you read for pleasure, what do you read? Hmm, for pleasure. <laughs> or don't you read for pleasure? Do you read for pleasure? We'll start there. Yeah, I read for pleasure. Yeah, I mean, something about the ego thrives during the reading. <laughs> uh, so I, I love the, the feedback from the audience. But do you mean do I read for pleasure? When you read at, when, when you're not reading your own work in front of the public, yeah. What? Oh yeah. I read for mostly novels. Some some you know, non fiction. Mm -hmm. But I always have to have a book going, uh, and I read before bed, before I fall asleep. Um, now, reading is very important to me. I'm saying this not only because I'm in a church that I'm in a library. It feels like a church. <laughs> I keep making the same mistake. But it's so beautiful. I mean, it's so. Do you know much about who the architect was? That I don't remember, but it, it's, it was built in 1883, so 140 years ago. And it was an architect out of Philadelphia, out of Philadelphia, whose name I don't recall. But. Well, it's, it's embracing. Yes, indeed. Well, do you have, do you have one more poem you'd like to share with us? If you'll bear with me for a minute, I'm still hooked, right? I got it. I'm just going to put it on here. This is one about insomnia. I look forward to my bed at night. I look forward to getting into my bed at night, fluffing up three pillows, covering myself up with the expensive duvet, all the way up to my chin, ready for sleep. The first few minutes hold promise. I feel I find a comfortable position that would let me ease from consciousness to nothing. But my position is still not right. I turn to the left, hug myself, and pull the covers tight over my hunched shoulder. Not right either. I turn the other direction, pausing at the bottom sheet to lift my weighted body to a better place where it may float like seaweed on the surface of the ocean. I had begun with soft yawns, tolerant of time spent. Now time has made me angry at myself, the pillows, the covers, even the rumpled sheet. I cannot, will not reach oblivion until daylight wakes me up and I am pleased. I see one more. Sure. Isolation. My feelings are hurt when my cat doesn't come up to my bed when I'm ready to go to sleep. 
Doesn't she love me at night as much as during the day when she wedges herself between my thigh and the end of my sofa, waiting to be stroked? When I'm almost asleep, I suddenly feel her forepaws pressing down on my shoulder and indenting my stomach. I'm happy to feel her intrusion. Should I turn to my left side or to my right? Asking the cat for permission. That sounds so silly during this time of isolation. 